We're going to finish our discussion of Ozark's stereotypes and the origins of those stereotypes and, and all that kind of stuff. We talked about the Arkansas image, and we mentioned this earlier. We, we know that uh, Appalachian stereotypes, Ozark stereotypes, had all kinds of commonalities. They really, uh, in many ways, they were interchangeable type stereotypes. And in the... Uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, you get this uh, explosion of literature about Appalachia. You get a, a limited number of books about the Ozarks as well, but there's just this, this whole subgenre of, of literature about Appalachia. Uh, some of it perpetuating these kind of hillbilly stereotypes, and some of it basically presenting Appalachia as this kind of Garden of Eden place. Uh, where people live these pre-modern lives and uh, everything's beautiful and bucolic and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the same sorts of images that you got with, with the Ozarks. And these uh, become so popular around the United States that they, they feed into Ozarks images as well because of the similarity of the, of the regions. The one book that was most responsible for helping cement some of these early 20th century images of the Ozarks was The Shepherd of the Hills by Harold Bell Wright. It was a book that was published in 1907, set in southwest Missouri. Wright was a young minister who, in an attempt to kind of regain his health, both physically and, and mentally, you might say, had, had come to southwest Missouri and lived out in uh, rural areas for a while and ended up writing this, this novel. How many of you have read The Shepherd of the Hills? Okay, we've got a couple people. I guess if you're from Branson, they make you read Shepherd of the Hills at some point. Did you read it to us one time? Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's definitely not 21st century literature. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not great literature, but... Even though it wasn't great literature, it became hugely popular in the early 1900s and had, a, had an influence well beyond its, its literary worth. You could say that for sure. And uh, millions of people read the book, and many of them came to the Ozarks as tourists. We'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a later class, uh, the influence the Shepherd of the Hills had on tourism in the region. And... Uh, and it also had this influence on people's idea of the Ozarks. In The Shepherd of the Hills, there are both kind of hillbilly characters and there are these kind of uh, rustic, heroic backwoods uh, characters as well. So you get both, both sides of that, of that stereotype in there. And certainly the uh, tourism industry benefits from that, but that's a topic for a later day. The Shepherd of the Hills presented what's sometimes referred to as an Arcadian vision of the Ozarks. Arcadia, uh, the way we use Arcadian in English usually refers to a place that's kind of uh, untouched by the modern world. It's uh, a beautiful, wild place. It refers back to a region of Greece, the ancient Greece, that was supposedly uh, this way, untouched and uh, kind of this, this romantic backwoods sort of area. And that's very much the image that Harold Bell Wright had of the Ozarks was this Arcadian place where, uh, that he would have considered God's country. You know, this is, you can go there, get away from the modern world, and rejuvenate yourself spiritually, physically. Uh, and that's a, the postcard has a picture of Harold Bell Wright on it, you can see there. So again, that, that other part of the image, a more positive part of the of Ozark stereotype. And this also went hand in hand in the early 20th century with those more positive attributes of the Ozarks, the, the physical attributes. This idea of the Ozarks as a playground a place with beautiful hills and rivers and lakes and all that kind of stuff where people could go and kind of get away from it all. 
And uh, you can see just a couple of examples here. In southeastern Missouri, you've got the Arcadia Valley, which, I mean, that's, uh, it's still there. You know, there's still, uh, that's still a place that people, uh, that, that was uh, one of the earliest places where the wealthy of St. Louis came to vacation because they could ride the rail from St. Louis and be there in a couple hours in the Arcadia Valley. And that has it right there in the name, that Arcadian uh, image of the unspoiled Ozarks. And you can see all their pictures on there. In all their pictures, there's, there are no people. You know, you got ele elephant rocks and Lake uh, Killarney and whatever that is. Pilot Knob in the background down there. But it was also around this time in the 1920s and 30s that the national media discovers the Ozarks in a big way. And you first start to see lots of newspaper and magazine coverage of the Ozarks, lots of stories, feature stories on the region, both of the region's uh, beautiful physical attributes and of the region's people. And those stories about the region's people uh, were a mixed bag. They could present them as uh, these uh, sort of romantic backwoods figures who seem to have stepped out of the pages of a history book that somehow haven't been modernized like the rest of the country and therefore were interesting and, and worthy of study or worthy of going to see. Or they could be the scary, dangerous backwoods hillbillies that uh, Easterners just didn't want any part of. It just kind of depended on the story. And there were lots and lots of these uh, magazine and newspaper stories beginning in the late 1920s when, when America discovers the, the Ozarks and the log cabin people of the Ozarks. Just a couple of headlines of articles these you could see. from the, These are from the New York Times. You gotta love Ozarks Hillbilly has put on shoes. You know, doesn't get much more stereotypical than that right there in the New York Times. So... Uh, this is, does it say what? Oh, that would be one that wasn't built either. He's either misidentified this. Uh, he may be supposed to be talking about the Osage River Bagnell oh. Dam or, or, or it was just one of the planned rivers that didn't come to fruition until much later uh, because there wasn't, as far as I can remember, there wasn't a, no, there wasn't a dam on the White River built around that time. See, that's 1929. So, yeah, it's either a misprint or it's just the dam never got built until years later. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and the New York, yeah, the, the writer wouldn't have been putting the headlines there anyway. The, you know, some editor would have been doing that. Here's another New York Times piece, The Land of the Arkansas Hillbilly. And what's interesting about this, uh, this is a 1932 uh, article, and the main picture up there on top was about 20 years old at the time. So, I mean, it was even, they're stereotyping, even, they even took outdated pictures and presented them as modern day, as the modern day Ozarks. And they probably didn't mind, you know, care, they probably didn't care one way or another, but. Uh, um, Let's see, I think she's carding, I think it says carding wool. So if you know what, yeah. if you've ever seen anybody carding wool, like at a, at a Silver Dollar City or something like that, pulling the wool over the those sticky cards. Here's a, here are a few more New York Times things. Um, and that idea up there, the, the headline, where the 18th century lives on, that was a very popular and romantic idea that people had of Appalachia and the Ozarks in those days, where, that these were places that had not kept up with the, the times and that the people lived basically like our ancestors lived. And if you wanted to see how your ancestors lived, just go to Appalachia or the Ozarks. They called them the contemporary ancestors. That was the phrase that was sometimes used. Uh, and again, you could find places like that in the Ozarks, but uh, for the most part, you know, that was more of an invention 
of uh, creative writers than, than anything else. Of course, there were other more uh, or less romantic images. By the time you get into, into the 1930s and the Great Depression and you have federal government organizations, you have, like Millie says, the Grapes of Wrath era, and you think of sometimes the, the poverty and suffering jumps out at you more than the romantic idea of these people living simple lives close to the land in a way that our ancestors lived them. And in the 1930s, you get lots of uh, government photographers, government-funded photographers taking pictures in the Ozarks that didn't quite look as romantic as some of the earlier pictures looked that often captured uh, the, the forlorn you know, suffering. And uh, this is an example. That's a picture that some of you may have seen, one of the, one of the more famous uh, images of the Depression. Right, yeah, that's, that's a good point, Daniel. Uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're, it's a picture of Ozark's poverty, but they do have a car that they're sitting in. And uh, not everybody would have. Um, but I guess uh, you could say, well, maybe they, they spent the rest of the money that they had on, on this car. And, and um, it's kind of like the Jodes did in the Grapes of Wrath, you know, to, to get somewhere, to get out of the Ozarks. And maybe that's what they're, they're trying to do. We really don't know what's going on. We just have a picture. And we all kind of fill in the backstory ourselves uh, looking at that. Uh, but, you know, it gives you a, a different image of the region. Here's another one. These are, are both photographs that were taken in the Ozarks. Now, the FSA stands for? The Farm Security Administration. But they, had, they for the arts, they... Now, the WPA had the arts program. Uh, yeah, the... <coughs> yeah, there were... Right, there were, there were different New Deal programs that, ha that uh, did things like hire photographers yeah. to go out and stuff like that. Uh, these just happened to be uh, Farm Security Administration photographs, uh, but other administrations hired photographers too. And while you're talking about the, the arts program, it was more of a, it was a WPA, the Works Progress right. Administration program, where they would hire out-of-work artists, or actors and stuff like that, and they would, you know, do, do various things. Again, just trying to get people work, trying to funnel money into the economy, that kind of prime the pump, as they called it in the, in the 1930s. But here you can see a picture of uh, kind of abject poverty. The, the log house here still has the bark on it. Remember we talked about that being a kind of sign of, uh, impoverishment, you know, if you've still got the bark on your house. Uh, that's something that the early settlers to the Ozarks never would have done, you know, built houses with bark on them. They always, you know, slicked them off and stuff. But the 1930s, at the same time that you get those images, the 1930s is kind of the great age of Ozarkers entertaining America in many ways, or, you know, the uh, hillbilly caricatures in American popular culture. It's the age of Dizzy Dean, the great Cardinals Hall of Fame pitcher of the 1930s. It's the era of the radio show Lummet Abner. These are, both of these were, uh, in their own ways, uh, kind of hillbilly characters. Dizzy Dean was actually from the Washitals, not the Ozarks, but he was he was associated in pop culture as kind of a hillbilly character. Uh, you know, pe people liked the way he talked. Uh, his bad English, English teachers didn't like the way he talked. But, uh, but he was a colorful character and, uh, you know, told big stories and all that kind of stuff. Lum and Abner, one of the most popular radio shows of the 1930s and 40s. Again, these two small town rural characters who were kind of, they were kind of good hillbilly characters, the, the good side of the hillbilly image. You know, they, they, were, they were nice and honest and just kind of salt of the earth people in this small town who usually because of their own honesty and good heartedness never made any money, ended up losing money to their customers at the, small, at the store that they owned. 
But all of these are part of the image. We've talked about the Weaver brothers in Elviry in here uh, and their, uh, their kind of hillbilly troupe that they had, theater troupe that they had during the vaudeville era. And they played up that hillbilly image a lot. But again, their playing up the hillbilly image was similar to like the Beverly Hillbillies. If you remember the show from the 1960s, the Beverly Hillbillies, if you remember that show, it, there, there was stereotyping to be sure on that show, but the hillbillies always win in the end. You know, they always come out on top. Jed Clampett, the patriarch of the hillbilly family, is always the smartest guy on the show, even though he's uneducated. And so there are, uh, it depends on, again, the perspective you bring to the show. I've never seen the Beverly Hillbillies or the, the movies that the Weaver brothers and Elviry did as, as negative portrayals of the Ozarks or of, or of hill people in general. I've always seen them more as, as positive That's sorts of things. Of That's right. And, and if you ever get to watch any of the Weaver brothers and Elviry movies, they're almost all like the same premise as the Beverly Hillbillies where it's, it's always the rich people or the city folks who come off looking bad. They look shallow and dishonest, and often just stupid, and uh, and usually, you know, the country folk always come out on top in these in these things, and so again, that stereotype, there's stereotyping involved, but as often as not, as not, it's uh, positive stereotyping. Uh, the, that that age, the Depression era, and into the 1940s had all kinds of, I mean, it really, became, the 1930s is the heyday of hillbilly movies and hillbilly uh, plays and, and all that kind of stuff. Why do you think it, that would be? Why would the 1930s of all decades be the... the dep People wanted to escape. That's part of it. Uh, we got uh, the Depression, uh, looking, for an, yeah, looking for an escape from the Depression. You got the war coming on in the early 40s. The, uh, and, and that's a big part of it too, as we'll see with the, the Ma and Paul Kettle, technology increasing and all that stuff. And if you look at it, in the 1930s, this greatest depression that, that the country ever had, and I think part of it too was that people saw in the hillbilly a survivor Someone who seemed uh, kind of like a cockroach, someone that you just couldn't kill off. And there's something redeemable about that kind of character in bad economic times. You know, these are people who know how to live on very little. They haven't been spoiled by all the modern conveniences that the rest of us have. And there's something, you know, there's something interesting about that. We weren't very sophisticated. And we weren't very sophisticated. Right, uh, yeah. Well, in, in pop culture, we weren't very sophisticated at all. Uh, now, I mean, you look at literature and symphonies and stuff like that, uh, it's, it's a different story. The, the sophistication is there, but it, it hadn't seeped into our pop culture the way it has today, where uh, even many of our TV shows or uh, seem very sophisticated to us in movies and, and, and stuff like that in a way that they didn't, you know, back in those days. Everything did seem simpler. But that probably, that probably goes for any generation. Everything always seems simpler in the, you know, in the previous generation. You know, even today, now the 90s all of a sudden seem like a simpler, happier time, don't they? You know, pre-2001, pre you know, the good old days. And it, it, I mean, it's strange that you would think about uh, things that way, but sometimes we do. Uh, Made in the Ozarks, uh, supposedly one of the worst stage plays ever, uh, but it toured the country and uh, was just, you know, full of these hillbilly stereotypes. And, and uh, uh, it's, well, it's, it's actually... Right, made, made, yeah, 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 made in the Ozarks about, well, it, who knows what, it was, uh, uh, all the reviews you read about it were just absolutely terrible, so it must have, must have just been the worst thing ever, yeah, but, but I'll get that up there. 
And then, of course, you have, uh, again, movies that are set in the Ozarks. The Shepherd of the Hills is made into, famously made into a film starring John Wayne, one of his early kind of big, you know, marquee roles. And, uh, and then you've got kind of the, uh, the spoof version of, of Shepherd of the Hills, Shepherd of the Ozarks. And, and you can see there's a typical hillbilly character. But again, this is the Hollywood poster that comes out. If you watch the movie, uh, the, the hillbillies in the movie, the, the Weaver Brothers and Elviry, come out on top in the end and uh, are more the he heroes than the butt of the joke in any of this. And then, of course, after World War II, you have uh, the continued evolution of, of hillbilly images, a lot of them to do with the Ozarks. Uh, some of them, uh, we, you know, you get, uh, as we'll see, the Beverly Hillbillies and the kind of domesticated hillbillies, uh, those sorts of things. You continue to have America's fascination with the outdoors of the Ozarks, and we'll see a couple of those images and that idea of the, the land that time forgot in the Ozarks. And we'll just take, quickly take a look at a few of those images here. And there's another one of those uh, nice Ozarks postcards from the 50s there. Keeps you entertained for a while, reading all the captions. Ma and Paul Kettle who there were several Ma and Paul Kettle films, the last of which uh, was The Kettles in the Ozarks. And uh, they, were a, they were a country family. Uh, most of their films didn't have anything to do with the Ozarks, but they were often associated with the Ozarks. And they were, uh, a lot of the comedy was set up by the Kettles moving into town or winning a new house with all these modern conveniences and stuff like that. Uh, kind of a space age uh, house where they don't know how to work all the gadgets and gizmos and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that kind of city, uh, country mouse in the city sort of comedy uh, built in there. But again, for the most part, the Kettles are honest, forthright people who usually come out on top in the end. Uh, they're those kind of salt of the earth country characters, even if they're a little bit hillbillyish. And we all know the Beverly Hillbillies. Has anybody never seen the Beverly Hillbillies? Really? No, no, I own some of their movies. Oh, oh you've, seen oh, you've seen them? Yeah. You've never seen the Beverly Hillbillies? Okay. That's, I, I would figure that would be on like the, the Branson <laughs> High School must-do list because uh, it's one of the things, uh, truthfully, it's one of the things that helped put Branson on the map is when the Beverly Hillbillies came to Silver Dollar City and filmed uh, like two or three episodes at Silver Dollar City. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's, yeah, you'll, you'll have to at least watch the Silver Dollar City episodes. But the Beverly Hillbillies is a great example of that dual image of the hillbilly. And this is a family that supposedly was from the Ozarks. The creator, if you don't know much about the background, the creator of the Beverly Hillbillies was a Missourian from Independence, uh, Paul Henning. And uh, he uh, claimed that he based the characters on his experiences as a child vacationing in the Ozarks, like so many people from the Kansas City area. His family actually came to southwest Missouri during his childhood and vacation. His characters were full of hillbilly stereotypes, you know, from the granny who shoots at everybody who drives up to, uh, you know, to Jethro, the half-wit, uh, but big, you know, muscular son, and, you know, all these, every stereotype you can think of uh, is in this family, but, the, but they're the heroes of the show. And as we were talking about earlier, it's the rich people of, of Beverly Hills and Los Angeles who are the, the butt of the jokes and, and on the show. Drysdale's, the, yeah, the Drysdale's. And his, and his oh, yeah, uh, Miss, yeah, Miss, what was her name? Jane, Jane yeah, Jane something. Jane, yeah. Yeah. Her last name. Right. At College of the 
Yeah, that, that car, the Beverly Hillbillies Mobile, is, is down at the College of the Ozarks Museum. Uh, you know, the Ralph Foster Museum down there. And, uh, but there, I mean, it's a good example where so much of the hillbilly stereotype depends on your persp- what the, the viewer's perspective, what you bring to the show. And if you want to see degenerate hillbillies, then, I mean, you'll see that. But Henning was, he was uh, taking a shot at a different part of society. He wasn't worried about making fun of hillbillies. He was, he was making fun of and kind of poking holes in, in this elite society, you know, the, the kind of ridiculousness of, of uh, this posturing uh, elite in, Beverly Hill, in the Beverly Hills and elsewhere. Uh, but a good example there uh, in the 1960s and into the 70s, and of course you still had, after World War II, you had all of these images of the bucolic Ozarks on postcards. And in, again, I, you see a lot of these are New York Times. It's not just because it's the New York Times, but uh, uh, I, I used to work at a college where we had access to the New York Times in full text, so I, got a, I, I pulled a lot of these articles from the New York Times, but you could find them in, in Chicago papers and St. Louis and Kansas City papers and all that, these, these articles about vacationing in the, in the wild and beautiful Ozarks. But you could also find lots of stories about the Ozarks, the, the sort of unique characteristics of the Ozarks, like the massive uh, rescue attempt uh, for a, for a coon dog in Reynolds County in, in Lesterville. That's over by the mountain. Yeah, it's over, in that, it's over in that area. Yeah, the Cottaway Hills area of the, of the eastern Ozarks. So that, that's the kind of thing. I mean, you, you might think, well, why in the world would the New York Times have an article on people saving a coon dog, going through all this trouble to save a coon dog somewhere in rural Missouri. And why would the New York Times have that in there? Well, because that was the best coon dog in Reynolds County. Well, apparently, apparently it was. <laughs> but it, it, also, it also fits that kind of crazy image of the Ozarks. Okay, I'm sure uh, when this came across a New York Times editor's desk, oh, he's probably thinking, you know, only... Yeah, only in the Ozarks would something like this happen. We got to put this in yeah. here. We got to find somewhere to stick this story in there, and uh, just to remind people, you know, this kind of stuff happens. You know, people are dynamiting hillsides trying to save a save a dog. <laughs> you know, the kid gets lost. Well, we'll get another one. You know, the dog. That's a different story. Yeah. No, I'm just, but, uh, and then, of course, uh, in, the, in the 60s, we, we talked about the, uh, the Clampets and the, the Beverly Hillbillies. It's also the age when you had the creation of maybe the most memorable example of using stereotypes for commerce in the Ozarks, and that was, that was the creation of the uh, Dog Patch USA theme park down south of Harrison, Arkansas, uh, which was in operation for about 25 years down there. And some of you uh, have been by the ruins of the theme park. I, I think that's, you drove down Highway 7 and, and went by the ruins down there. Yeah, it's still, it's still a popular place for people to go and kind of uh, trespass and, and poke around in. Yeah, Faubus ran the park for a year. Yeah, the, the former uh, governor of Arkansas, who was governor during the Little Rock Central high crisis, uh, ran the, the park for a year after he left the governor's mansion in Arkansas. But that, uh, that, was, a, that was an example where uh, the, the theme park, Dog Patch USA, was based on a comic strip that... Uh, was very much like the Beverly Hillbillies TV show, a comic strip about people in this backwoods hillbilly town, uh, but the, the comic strip, for the most part, used them to make fun of the wealthy and uh, pompous, rich people and, and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of, there were, 
there were a lot of uh, examples of stereotyping at that, at that uh, theme park down in Arkansas. And I'm not sure how much that had to do with its uh, ultimate failure. Probably more just the location. You know, it's, a, it's not where you would think of somebody putting a multi-million dollar theme park uh, even today. It's pretty inaccessible down in there. And the rest of it is just uh, various images of the Ozarks. Uh, that some of them don't have anything to do with anything except that they're just <laughs> to do with the Ozarks, and they're and they're kind of neat. Uh, yeah, your your cheap little dime novel. Yeah, that's that's what I'll assign next time if it's still in print. Yeah, yeah, take the class again, read Desire in the Ozarks. Uh, this is from the Hillbilly Inn from Lake uh, the Lake of the Ozarks area. And, of course, that's an example of, you know, the, 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 the word hillbilly is used a lot in Ozark's promotion, and sometimes in, usually in more positive ways, uh, more postcards with hillbilly imagery on them. We even sucked Kansas in on that one. Yeah, so, yeah, so much... So much for your Kansas relatives who, who don't want to be associated with us. They're, yeah, they're in there with the, the hillbillies, getting the smoke rings blown on them or something there, whatever. There's, yeah, still the dog. Uh, postcard, these are obviously more modern, modern day postcards. The family there is an interesting story in and of itself. The, the, most of the hillbilly postcards and calendars and stuff you would see in the Ozarks featured that family, the Seton family, who lived in southwest Missouri and basically made a living uh, on these postcards and, and stuff like that. And they actually, uh, they actually lived sort of, they were like living history uh, actors. Uh, they they kind of lived this hillbilly lifestyle and took pictures of themselves and stuff like that. And I think that's the last one. Now here's a, a different, this, that's not the, t the stereotypical Ozarks woman. This is a different, uh, yeah, this one, yeah, has, has been getting more grub than, than the other women have. But you still got the, uh, the, the guy is pretty stereotypical looking and the shotgun and all that kind of stuff. And that's a pretty high priced postcard, 50 cents. You know, that's probably from the 50s. That was, that was a humdinger of a postcard those days a really a really good one I think yeah that's the end of it so that's uh, that's our discussion of stereotypes we know that stereotypes are still with us they're still part of the Ozark story uh, they've been around for the better part of 200 years and are and are not likely to go away anytime soon and there are people in the region who who still profit off of these hillbilly stereotypes who don't want them to, to go away. Branson doesn't as much as it used to. If you'd been in Branson 25 years ago, there was more of that attempt to play up the Ozarks hillbilly image than there is today. It's become uh, more, uh, well, I don't know if you call it upscale, but it's become, it's, it's distanced itself more from that hillbilly image in the last 25 years with Andy Williams and all that Shoji, Tabuchi, and all that kind of stuff than it, than it did before. You know, did we discuss this in class here, or did I read it somewhere? <coughs> 60 Minutes did a, art, did a program. Did we discuss that in there? Uh, if we didn't, and, we and, will. And, and the, oh, I'm, yeah, well, go ahead. Go ahead. And I remember the attendance went. <coughs> right. Uh, yeah, what Butch is referring to, uh, the, the 60 Minutes special on Branson that came out, I believe, in, in late 1991. Did we talk about that in, in this class? And, uh, and that's uh, one of the things that, that caused tourism and visitation to just really skyrocket in Branson. It, it really just jumped tremendously from one season to the next. And, of course, it kind of, yeah, it sort of. After that season, though, didn't it? Right. It, it, uh, it really it spiked there in the uh, kind of early to mid-90s, and then it kind of tailed off. And. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the, the latest numbers are, but, uh, but that was really kind of the, in many ways, th that was the, the Branson bubble 
in the in the nineties. I mean, you know, it's not like Branson has closed down now, but uh, but that bubble at some point was going to burst. You couldn't just you know the Ponzi scheme thing. You couldn't just keep growing exponentially forever. And at some point, it kind of reached a you know this mass of people, and then and then kind of tailed off in that way. But it's still a very busy place. And, but as I said, uh, Branson doesn't make near the attempt to play up the hillbilly image that it once did. Still got the bald knobbers and Presley's uh, jubilee that, that they have hillbilly comedians at those shows. And you still see hillbilly this and that occasionally in Branson, but it's not near as front and center as it was when I was a kid and people went to Branson. And Silver Dollar City, you know, was much more Ozarky. In country back in those days and the the craft people and the music was much more a uh, part of that scene than it is today where you got the roller coasters and 